Just a heads up, this episode contains explicit language and subject matter not suitable for young listeners. Yeah, for sure. But Bonk tell me niggas been going through there hitting innocent bystanders and shit. So they not they not they not out here right, homie. They we cut from a different cloth. They still doing dry cars. We don't operate like that. Get up close and personal and do your business. What you just heard was a segment of a wiretap recorded by the Los Angeles Police Department in December 2003. The phone they were listening to belonged to Pierre Romain, and that is his voice you just heard talking about drive-by shootings and taking care of business up close and personal. He sounds to me like a gang member, and the police said the person he was talking to, who we won't name here, was a gang member as well. They were listening to Pierre's phones because he was a suspect in a murder in Hollywood 16 years earlier. But at the time of this recording in 2003, Romaine was a sworn police officer with the Department of Defense. In fact, he was a supervisor in charge of several other officers at Los Angeles Air Force Base. The LAPD had Pierre Romain's voice on hundreds of hours of telephone recordings. In some of them, he spoke like a gang member, in some like a cop, and others like a husband and a father. But all told, Romain was still a mystery man. He was the man who outwardly showed all signs that he had left gang life behind and was on the road to redemption. He had moved far away from South Los Angeles and started a family. He worked as a police officer and had risen through the ranks of his department to sergeant. Thus we get two sides of Pierre Romain, gangster and cop, accused of cold-blooded murder. In this episode, we are going to get into the split persona of Pierre Romain. This is Chapter 3 of The Telltale Bullet. I'm Michael Connolly. This is Murder Book. We just lost our best witness. I don't know what the hell I saw, if I saw anything or not. If it wasn't my blood 16, 17 years ago, what's going to make it mine now? We're never going to get justice for Jay Clark. Thank you to this week's sponsor, the website Novel Suspects. I'm fascinated with the mystery of Pierre Romain and why he wanted so much to be a police officer. The irony of it is that his efforts to join the police department were what popped him up again on the radar of Detective Rick Jackson and ultimately led to murder charges being filed against him. So in the end, his desire to protect and serve the community led to his undoing. The mystery to me is in regard to his intentions. The FBI has put out bulletins for years warning that gang members are infiltrating our military services and police departments. Was that Romain's goal, to be a gangbanger with a badge? Or did he have an altruistic motive in wanting to be a cop? Was he trying to make up for something in his past? By all accounts, he served well in the Department of Defense Police. He was a good cop. In 1998, he had transitioned from a paid security contractor to sworn officer assigned to the Los Angeles Air Force Base. His resume included his training and service as a military police officer in the Air Force and a stint as an armored car driver. According to an LAPD report documenting Romaine's background, all of his performance evaluations at the base were excellent. His supervisor said he had superior investigative skills and that those skills had led to convictions in several cases. The base where he worked is primarily a highly sensitive research center for projects dealing with military satellites and space-based defense systems. I recently sat down with Detective David Serek of the Los Angeles Police Department. 20 years ago, he was a police officer with the Department of Defense and Pierre Romain was his supervisor. He was actually really sharp. I mean, mm-hmm. it is a physical presence, mm-hmm. spit shine, shiny badge. You know, he's kind of the poster boy. What you would expect if you opened the door and you had called the police. It's kind of what you expect, you know, guys in shape, sharp. Um, was always fair to me. Never had a run in with him. I took this question to Tim Marsha and Mitzi Roberts, 
the two detectives who inherited the case after Rick Jackson retired for a second and final time from the LAPD. These are two of the best detectives and people I know, and I really respect their people reading skills as well as their cop instincts. Just this past Christmas, Marsha caught a case in which a mother and son were brutally murdered. He worked the case with other detectives through the holidays and for 40 straight days until they made an arrest. Roberts, as I mentioned in last week, is the inspiration behind the character Renee Ballard in my novels. She's another Everybody Counts cop. Several years ago, when she was working cold cases, she connected three quote-unquote throwaway cases, prostitutes found murdered in the city's poorest neighborhoods. But she worked the case like the victims had been three nuns and eventually tracked a suspect down on the other side of the country. A man named Sam Little was arrested for the crime. He was convicted and sentenced to prison. You may have heard of Sam Little by now. In recent months, he started confessing from the cell Roberts put him in, admitting to dozens of murders committed across the country during a decades-long killing spree. He was only in prison because of the relentless work of Mitzi Roberts. I asked Roberts and Marcia whether they came across anything in this case that led them to believe Pierre Romain had an ulterior motive in wanting to be a cop. Why did Pierre Romain want to be a police officer? Was it he wanted to be a good guy or was there a, a deeper, more sinister motive? In our research, we were never able to sort of come up with anything conclusive that he was using his law enforcement to benefit the gang at all. It's almost like they were separating. I think he lived a life that he really wanted was law enforcement, and he saw himself as a good cop. Here's Detective David Sarek again. I think initially, Pierre was a guy that grew up in the streets, went into the military probably to get away from that lifestyle. You know, maybe he had good intentions. I can't speak about his mm-hmm. intentions, but I think you're on to something in the sense that once he got hired by DOD, he felt that he was trying to kind of, you know, live that next phase of his life, at least a, you know, up, upstanding citizen. Yeah, I think he had always, it sounds like he had always wanted to be a cop. You know, was this a guy that was trying to infiltrate law enforcement because he was a gang member? My gut feeling says no. I think it was more of a guy who made whatever mistakes he made in his life and was actually trying to, to, to better himself and his family. I'm not trying to make an overly romantic view of it, but I, I mean, that's just my honest opinion. Right. When Rick Jackson and Tim Marsha reopened the case in 2003 and got a warrant from a judge to take a DNA sample from Pierre Romain, they knew that as soon as they knocked on his door that what they were doing was going to cause a lot of concern and most likely would stimulate some phone calls from Romaine to people he had run with in his gang life. So they got a second warrant as well, a warrant to put taps on Romaine's cell phone and his home phone number. Once the taps were in place, they went out to San Bernardino County, where he now lived with his family, and knocked on the door. They told him they were there to take saliva swabs from his mouth. Almost immediately after the visit, the phone call started. And remember, at the time of these wiretaps in 2003, Romaine was a badge and gun-carrying police officer and a supervisor of several other officers as well. Once again, a heads up. These calls contain extreme language. Which I know is the same from the ground. You know what I'm saying? Yes, 
Yeah. Yeah, they trying to say that we couldn't test that because it wasn't enough. You know what I mean? Yeah, enough yeah. fly for us to test. So, uh, you know, they try to get a nigga on uh, saliva and shit to try to compare it to the, you know, slob left on the bullet and shit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. 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 That's what they said? Yeah, that's what they said when they come up in there this morning and shit, you know, something, something, you know? Yeah. You know? <clears throat> that was some of them fools, like, on CSI, they came over there? Mm-hmm. No shit? Yeah, it was a gang of motherfuckers, man, just, uh, you know, regular motherfuckers, and they had Rialto with them and shit, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, they just came on a search <clears throat> warrant to get that shit and then got up out of here. So, you yeah. know, I'm like, yeah, you know, it's going to be the same results from 17 years ago, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, and yeah. shit change, how the shit can change all of a sudden if it ain't mine 17 years ago, now all of a sudden it's mine. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Try to convince that to a jury. Yeah, yeah. You know, so they reaching on me. They just mad that a nigga ain't out there like a nigga used to be and they ain't getting a nigga caught up like they want a nigga caught up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. You know? So, yeah, yeah. so that's why I was trying to holler, homie, you know what I'm saying, when all the shit was jumping off because the nigga got love for you because I was trying to make sure you was focused, you know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? You ain't lose your perspective, nigga, because nigga don't want to see you twisted up at all, my nigga. Over the next several weeks, they accumulated hundreds of hours of phone calls to or from Romaine. Many of those he talked to were identified as gang members, but there was no smoking gun tape. The detectives and prosecutors debated what was said and meant by Romaine on several of the calls but Romaine never said anything that clearly implicated him in the killing of Jade Clark. To refresh your memory on the details of the case, 21-year-old Jade Clark was fatally shot in his own car in 1987 near a Hollywood nightclub. During the shooting, he fired a bullet at his own killer, which was later discovered on the ground at the crime scene by the LAPD. A few weeks into the investigation, an informant led them to Pierre Romaine, who was arrested and questioned. After gathering physical, circumstantial, and witness evidence, the police charged Romaine with murder. But then the key witness in the case, Clifford Phillips, Jade's passenger on the night of the killing, had gone off on his own and got himself hypnotized so he might better remember the details of the crime and the man who had killed his friend. In legal terms, this was a no-no, and Clifford was not allowed to testify. That crippled the case, and it was eventually dropped. Pierre Romain was set free. Detective Rick Jackson was the lead investigator on the case from the very beginning. Almost 16 years went by, 16 years that included his retirement and then return to the LAPD before he reopened the case. He submitted the bullet that Jade had fired at his killer to new DNA analysis in hopes that the result would link the human tissue on the bullet to the murderer of Jade Clark. I remember the day we got the call. I think it was December 17th. It was in the afternoon. I got a call from one of the lab people that did serology work and he had gotten a notification from the private lab that had done it, that it was a, a match between the DNA sample we'd taken from Pierre Romain and the DNA from the tissue on the bullet. We immediately got a warrant for his arrest, got the case filed. We had already prepped the DA's office and given him everything. We were just waiting for the final confirmation that was submitted to them. They filed the warrant. We walked it through to get it done quickly in the next hour or so, and then the surveillance units had him un under observation and made the arrest as soon as the warrant was signed. He was arrested in South LA. Uh, he was with a friend of his from childhood days who was a Rolling 60 gang member who was on parole for kidnapping and rape and was also on several of the phone calls that we had picked up on the wire. They were parked somewhere at a, at a business location. I don't remember the real specifics, but the surveillance team took him into custody, brought him to us for the potential interview, which we almost knew positively he was not going to talk to us, and he didn't. And then he was arrested and booked at jail division at the Parker Center. You may think DNA is the panacea. 
You match DNA from a crime scene to a suspect, and it's a slam dunk, right? Not in the Jade Clark case. The LAPD had Pierre Romain's DNA on a board fired by Jade Clark in the very last act of his life. But in this case, it was always two steps forward and then one step back. Romain the gang member was now Romain the federal police officer, serving as a supervisor on a force that provided security at two bases in Los Angeles. Los Angeles Air Force Base in El Segundo and Fort MacArthur down in San Pedro. Romain now had insider knowledge of the criminal justice system and would become a formidable foe in the efforts to bring him to trial. So this is really kind of confounding. How did a guy who had been twice arrested for separate murders was a in the gang files as a member of one of the most violent gangs in South Los Angeles? How does he end up with a badge and a... Uh, a gun holstered on his hip. That's the exact thing I thought when I first heard that. And ultimately, from my research through talking to people from the, uh, the federal government, he initially had been hired as a contract company employee that provided more security services for the LA Air Force Base. But a lot of their work entailed having to use sworn officers from the neighboring cities. And so eventually they opted to become a sworn department with the Department of Defense Police at the LA Air Force Base. Once again, Detective David Surik. There was a lot of animosity with him and some of the other people that were working there. Part of that's just from, they had some contracted security guards. And then when they expanded to become DOD police, they hired some officers that maybe were injured at other departments here in Southern California or some guys that just transferred. So I think there was maybe a lack of respect because he had never been a, an actual police officer and now he's a supervisor. So a little dynamic there, but I mean, I never got into that. Do you, do you know, did he have to go through any training to make that transition from essentially a security guard to a police officer? Like, did they send them to any kind of post thing? Or Some of the guys did and some didn't. There was, an, I believe, if I recall correctly, they had initially set up a date and it, everybody was going to go through uh, FLETSI, which is a federal law enforcement training center in Glencoe, Georgia. And that's probably, probably a two-month course, relatively short. Um, but the date got moved up, so some guys went from security guard to DOD police officer, I think almost overnight. And then they've slowly farmed them out to the to the academy. Okay. And yeah. do you think that happened with Pierre? I know he know eventually that? went, yeah. Okay. He eventually went. As a contract employee, Pierre Romain had risen to the rank of lieutenant. And Chuck, when I hear that, it's just kind of mind-boggling. But they uh, did what they said was kind of a minimal background because he said he had done the job fairly well and hadn't had too many issues. And they were aware of some things in his background. They saw the one murder case, but they took him on his word that had been dismissed for DNA. And several of his arrests had been taken off his rap sheet for factual innocence that he had manipulated into getting. And they hired him. As a sergeant, they downgraded him as a sergeant, but he's now a sworn sergeant, a supervisor. That's how it happened. So do you think we just accept this as, as one of these cases where someone slipped through the cracks? Or is it something that is a greater, you know, a greater concern? Because this guy was not only, you know, street legal with his weapon, but he got he was close to things. He could have done a lot of damage to a lot of people. He could have, and I, I think it's it's the worst case I've heard of, of somebody getting that type of a job where there's definitely documented history. I mean, there have been people that have gotten jobs where it's not really documented and it's determined later, but this guy had this stuff documented before and it just didn't get investigated properly before he was hired. According to federal documents, Romaine's hiring as a police officer was controversial because of his arrest record. An internal DOD memorandum written in 1999 states the following. We were aware of Mr. Romaine's background prior to selecting him last year. 
We noted that the more recent arrests resulted in charges either being dropped or he being found factually innocent. Per legal counsel, citing Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, arrests that do not result in conviction may not be used in making employment determinations. What carried the most weight for us in making the employment decision was Mr. Romaine's conduct, performance, and service as a contracted security officer at the Los Angeles Air Force Base. He rose to the rank of lieutenant and served as a shift supervisor. We felt that his employment history was more relevant than older arrests. The DOD police, and nothing against them, that kind of tended to be the land of misfit toys. Mm-hmm. You know, had a lot of guys that didn't qualify to be a police officer here in California for whatever reason. Maybe they got disqualified in the process for who knows what, uh, or they were injured, or there was something lacking. So the federal requirement to be a DOD police officer is a lot less than LAPD or the sheriffs or, or what have you. So you had a handful of guys that were like that, that were that were there. But I never really got to a direct uh, answer from Pierre why he was, you know, you found out that he was applying to all these different agencies and not getting hired. Normally there's something in the background, you know, maybe stole something, narcotics, you know, common, something relatively common like that, or drug usage that was too recent to the point that you're uh, applying for the new position. A couple times that I asked him, he kind of gave me these vague answers, which led me to believe that he probably wasn't being honest, and now we know why. I still remember when I got called in by, by Rick to be interviewed, what was different about it, and I was just sharing with someone out here in the hallway. Normally, if we ask, like myself as a detective now, I'm a supervisor, if I ask a, an officer to come back because I want to talk to him about a case or something I have information on, I don't bring him in the interview room. I just stands at my desk, asks the questions, right. and he or she goes about their way. Uh, but it was different there. I went to RHD, which was at the old uh, police headquarters building at Parker Center. And so they put me in the interview room, which... Put you on alert? Yeah, immediately. So I don't know if they knew I had some prior law enforcement background, but it, I'm like, okay, this is this is a little bit more than mm-hmm. when we have a couple questions for you. And you could tell by the line of questioning that they wanted to know if he and I had a friendship or maybe I was, a, I think, a part of whatever he had done prior to. It was easy to explain away within a minute or two of the interview. Well, what was, the, how did they find out that you guys knew each other? Was this, like, and that you're an LAPD officer? Was it like, do you think they looked through LAPD records to see who would have worked at that Air Force base or something? No, I, if I if I recall correctly, Pierre had applied, and I think it was San Francisco, he put me down as a reference. Oh, okay. Yeah. And did they, they ever call you about him? The, San Francisco PD, no. I don't, I don't remember. They may have sent out a mailer. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't recall that far back. I know they didn't call. And then I got the call from from Rick, you know, to to come in, and eventually they showed me. Oh, is it, you know, why would it must he? Have, yeah, it must have been strange though to be in the interview room and they're they're saying like, why were you his reference or something? Yeah, oh, it was. Yeah, yeah you could feel it, but it it dissipated real quickly. <laughs> there were a lot of rumors about Pierre. I mean, there was the DOD was kind of known as a springboard. A lot of guys were just coming there. You know, waiting to be hired by whether it be LAPD or any other you know agency because there was a big pay difference. You know what you mm-hmm. get paid there and what you get paid at you know here or another police department in Southern California. But there was a handful of guys, and you could normally tell when someone came in, like oh, you know, he's not gonna, he or she's not going to be here very long. And the ones that ended up not going on normally there was something in their background that prohibited them from doing so. And most of the guys were relatively forthcoming about it. You know, oh, I did this when I was a juvenile or, you know, sometimes right. it's relatively minor. But with Pierre, it was all kind of different rumors. And I think a lot of guys felt that he probably had some gang ties at one time. Just I mean, just in the way he carried himself. Well, there was something in the uh, murder book that said that uh, when he got to the point that a department was interested in him, part of the background is the lie detector test, and he kept failing, not, failing those. And you have some experience in um, in your education, right, in terms of studying lie detectors and so forth. Correct. When, when Well, when I graduated high school, I went in the Army, and I was a military police officer there. So my last year, I took... Um, they have an MPI, which is Military Police Investigator School, kind of like a detective. And part of that training is that we were exposed to the polygraph. 
So the polygrapher would come in, explain all the, how the process works, how the machinery works. So eventually when I went to college, my senior year, I'd write a paper and I just chose that just because I felt comfortable with it, something mm -hmm. I was relatively interested in. I don't remember how that came up with Pierre, but he started asking me more questions and it became obvious to me it wasn't just a common interest, it was something that you know, he was having difficulty with, with these different police departments. He wanted to know if there's any way to beat it, and mm -hmm. I don't just—I felt it was odd, an, an odd question. At what point did you become aware of his history? You know, was it not till he was arrested for the second time and you found out he was a rolling '60s crip, or or formerly had been? Correct. That's how I found out. It was actually in downtown, uh, downtown LA, and there was some kind of building evacuation with one of the federal properties. And a person that I had worked with at DOD had transferred over to FPS, a Federal Protective Service. And I ran into him. So you were LAPD at the time? I was LAPD at the time. Yeah. Okay. And I ran into him and, you know, a little bit of small talk. And then he, he just asked me, like, did you hear what happened to Pierre? And I hadn't. So you, you heard about his arrest? Correct. Okay. So. Even though there was things about him that were like, you know, asking about lie detector tests and so forth, it wasn't a known thing within the police force at Los Angeles Air Force Base that people knew about his background. He was able to kind of keep that. I mean, there might have been some suspicions, but no one knew his real background. Correct. I think one of the things that really stood out about Pierre is there was a time when we'd finished some training and we still were on the books for, I don't know, a few more hours, and we were gonna to go to Fort MacArthur. We were at, at, uh, in El Segundo mm -hmm. at the Air Force Base, had a couple hours of training, and it was right before the, I think the DNC was coming up, and so we were doing some squad training for that, just in case they were gonna protest at any of the federal buildings. So we finished, and he was like, hey, I'm gonna go get my boot shine. Do you wanna do you wanna go get a haircut? I'm like, yeah, why not? He's my supervisor. And so we ended up, I thought we would go down to San Pedro, where Fort MacArthur was at, we also had a uh, room there at the billets. Instead, he took me into Inglewood. And so the Rolling 60s gang member, and I don't know if Pierre was a member of them, I just, that was the gang I ended up working, but he was very familiar with that area. Inglewood, the east side of Inglewood and the west side of the city of Los Angeles, which is the area I ended up working as a gang officer when I was at 77th. That's yeah. interesting. Um, I didn't know that, that you, when you came on with LAPD, you, I don't know if it was right away, but eventually you were working gangs in, in South LA. Yeah. And w so Rolling Sixties was a gang that you happened to uh, work? Correct. Was that a specific uh, assignment or? Uh... Specific assignment, yeah. So I was at 77th Division and I was working gangs and then I got assigned to the Rolling Sixties, which is basically a gang on the west side of the of the division at Borders Inglewood. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, that, that's interesting that, I mean, at the time you had not heard anything about Pierre, right? R right. Yeah. So his name never came up or anything like that? No. And... But we would go to get a, our boots shined and our hair cut, and I mean, clearly, the people that were there, I mean, it's infested with gang members, and he felt right at home. They all knew him by name, and that stood out to me as a little wow. bit odd that he still had that you know this friendship i know a lot of a lot of officers come from what maybe a certain area right. inner city or what have you you don't necessarily sever those ties to the point where you won't acknowledge somebody if you walk in but when we walked in it seemed as if he was it wasn't the first time he ran into him in years it's the normal place he went to get his hair cut and boot shined and that i mean it stood out at me i didn't really confront him on mm -hmm. it i just said hey you is that the spot you normally go oh i just go in there to get my my hair cut my boot shined but clearly everybody knew him Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a spot he goes once a month. When we left there, I couldn't wait to get out of there. Okay, let me take a moment here to thank one of our sponsors. This episode of Murder Book is brought to you by Novel Suspects. Novel Suspects is a website and newsletter that lines up the best coverage of the world of mystery and thrillers, including books, television, podcasts, and movies, then delivers it right to your laptop, tablet, phone, or inbox. Novel Suspects talks to the biggest names in the genre. Lee Child, David Baldacci, Sandra Brown, Alifair Burke, and Harlan Coben, just to name a few, to find out what books they are reading, shows they are binge-watching, and their latest true crime podcast obsessions. I wonder if they are listening to Murder Book right now. They even interviewed me, Michael Connolly, a few times. You can find all this and more at novelsuspects.com slash murderbook. 
Again, that's NovelSuspects.com slash murder book. Novel Suspects, lining up the best in mystery and thriller. Now, back to murder book. After Romaine's arrest in 2003, it seemed like the police would finally get justice for Jade Clark. But first, they had to go through a bail hearing. A routine hearing that turned out to be anything but routine. I talked to Detective Rick Jackson about what happened on that day. When we re-arrested him in 2003, bail for murder, unless it was a special circumstance like potential death penalty or life without parole, it was automatically set at a million and it could vary from there if the circumstances, if they were mitigating or aggravating circumstances to either lessen it or raise it. So he got a million dollar bail initially. The bail hearing was set for maybe April or so of 2004, a few months after he's arrested. I was going to be out of town when the bail hearing was there. So I remember writing down a list of seven or eight, nine things to argue either for to raise bail or definitely not to lower bail. And the reasons I cited, and I don't have a list now in front of me, but Uh, of everything I wrote, but the key one was in the past he had had people approach witnesses in cases against him and basically threaten them or intimidate them and suggest what they should say to change their testimony so it would benefit him. He still on the wiretap showed that he was still talking with gang members. He was still talking the gang talk, talking about drive-bys, things like this. He had access to weapons. He owned weapons. He worked with weapons. He also had access to computer databases to determine witnesses' locations or people that could do that form that he worked with. So I wrote down those things. I gave them to one of my coworkers, Cliff Shepard, who was you know, a pretty diligent guy. And I asked him if he would attend the bail hearing. I had given the list to him. I would also given the list to the deputy district attorney who was handling the case at that time. Uh, she wasn't the one that followed the case through. And then I get back and I hear that his bail had been lowered in half, dropped in half to half a million, and that he had bailed out. And I, I was kind of shocked. And I found out through talking to uh, Cliff Shepard and from other checking that the defense argued that his bail should be lowered. He had been a police officer for a period of time. And all the reasons that I had listed, which I think would have definitely not had his bail lowered, were not even argued by the deputy district attorney at the hearing. She submitted it based on just the information that was part of the filing. Once again, Detective Tim Marsha. We were sickened. I mean, Rick and I were on the case at that time, but the whole cold case unit had played a part in this. All the things that were learned on the wiretap, such as that he was formerly a gang member and appears to still have gang contacts, the um, paraphrased statements that were picked up of Pierre stating that uh, on a recent drive-by shooting that... The way they used to do it was more personal, that they would walk up and do it themselves. Get up close and personal and do your business. That information was presented to the uh, DA and the DA chose not to represent that into at court. And that's why he ended up getting bail. And it was disgusting, actually. I mean, this case would have been over a long time ago, but... Um, that was a fateful day. You know, he, he just should not be someone that it would have his bail cut in half that gave him a chance to be out and about with all those factors. And that was being presented and that was a little frustrating and, and, and I think was the main reason to start this whole delay process. If you're out on bail, granted, I, mean, I think a lot of people would like to just have things resolved, but if in the resolution process that you're awaiting, if your ability to be free 
it's one of those things. Why not delay it as long as you can and have as much free time in case you do get convicted when you go? How long were you a uh, homicide detective? I worked homicide for the last 28 years of my career. So a lot of cases, how many times do you remember that uh, someone that you arrested for murder was granted bail while awaiting trial? I can't think of any other case during my time. There may have been a couple that they were charged with manslaughter because of the circumstances and maybe then they had a potential for bail. I can't even think of a specific case. There may have been one, especially in this kind of a case, a first degree murder. Uh, very rare. Very, I, I, I mean, never, even O.J. Simpson didn't make yeah, that. Yeah, well, actually, when I was, yeah, when I was earlier in my career, there was at times no bail for murder. I mean, that was the initial bail that was given when you book no bail. The judge could change it, but I don't remember anybody ever bailing out off the top of my head. Every single person I talked to about the Romaine case said this was the critical moment in the case that allowed what they at least viewed as a miscarriage of justice to occur and extend for more than 15 years. And to those who are unfamiliar with bail in criminal cases and how it works, let me try to explain it. If your bail is set at half a million dollars, that is a lot of money. But you do not need to have that kind of money on hand. There are ways around it. If you have equity in your house or other equities in cars, collectibles, and so forth, you can put that up. In fact, there were wiretap phone calls that had Romaine explaining just that. Because he owned his home in Rialto, he was saying that if he gets arrested, he'll need to get reduced bail and use the equity in his home to post it. Another means to get bail is to go to a bondsman and buy a bond to cover your bail, which is usually 10% of the bail amount. So for 50 grand, it would be possible for Romaine to get out of jail on a first degree murder case and be free while using all his skills and knowledge to delay his day in court. And that's exactly what he did. I know a fair number of criminal defense attorneys and I often write about one in my novels. Fiction, nonfiction, they all have the same piece of advice for clients who are out of jail, on bail, and awaiting trial. They say, enjoy your freedom for as long as you can. The point of that piece of advice is that anything can happen in trial, anything bad. It's important to remember that prosecutors don't go to trial in any case without being confident that they have all the advantages and a very high chance of getting a guilty verdict. There are no prosecutors with losing records. They wield the power and might of the government and all the advantages that come with that. I don't know if any attorney ever gave such advice to Pierre Romain, but I would say he certainly knew it and took its meaning to a level rarely seen before in American jurisprudence. After bailing out, Romain enjoyed his freedom to the max, manipulating the system and causing legal delay after legal delay. And it wasn't a case of delaying the inevitable. Each of these holdups increased the chances that the state would be unable to ever mount a prosecution. Over these years, key people in the case had died, witnesses' memories faded, and even the lead investigator retired. All things that, when put together, imperiled a murder case that was already fraught with major challenges. I know Romaine is the accused in this story and not a lawyer, but at times, he's the one who comes off to me as some kind of a legal genius. Once again, Detective Mitzi Roberts. He knew the system and how to buy himself more time by by getting new lawyers and putting on defenses. A lot of t uh, several times he put out that he was going to accept a plea, and then and it would come down to accept the plea. And then I remember one time he said, "Well, I just want to wait till my son graduates." And then his son graduated, and then it was like, "I don't want to accept the plea anymore. I'm going to get a new attorney." So he he completely worked the system, and I remember. Me coming into it late in the game, I remember turning to Tim and being so disgusted because I said, this guy has been out of custody longer than Jade Clark lived his life. Pierre's been allowed to commit a murder and live a free man longer than Jade Clark was ever even on this earth. And that disgusted me. And I couldn't understand, first of all, how 
the prosecution was not being a little more firm on making this go forward. And uh, with all we talk about Marcy's Law, I know Tim and I talked about maybe seeing if the mom wanted to get a Marcy's Law attorney to, to get this moving forward. What is Marcy's Law? So that um, Marcy's Law came from, I don't know all the specifics about it, but it, it has to do a lot with victims' right in court. And, and one of the big things is their right also to a speedy trial. <laughs> They have a right to go in and have a speedy trial and for it not to drag on and on and on forever. And this is the perfect example, especially after the DNA, of how can, how can this case still not have went to trial? Because the victim has rights too, and it seemed like the only one that was being represented in this whole thing was Pierre Romain, like his rights. When you switch lawyers, what is that? Does that like guarantee you another year of delay? Like a lease a year? Or? Yeah, because then the lawyer can go in and say, I need to look at, you know, there's all these documents. There's volumes and volumes, and we might want to file this motion, and we might want to do this. And, and it just, it's almost like you start the process from the beginning again. Even with the DNA seemingly irrefutably connecting him to the murder of Jay Clark, the prosecution knew that this was no slam dunk case. Little did they know at the time that Romaine would be able to play the system to avoid stepping into a courtroom and that big challenges in bringing justice for Jay Clark had only just begun. Would Detective Rick Jackson be able to resurrect the case? Would Romaine ever stand before a jury? We'll get into that in Chapter 4 of Murder Book. You killed this guy. You're going to have to answer for that. I'm Michael Connolly, and you've been listening to Murder Book. If you like what you've heard, please tell your friends about the podcast. You can also support the show by subscribing on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Leave us a rating and a review because it really helps us out. I want to thank our sponsors and the investigators who spoke with us. Murder Book is produced and edited by Terrell Lee Langford. The music comes from Grace Kelly. And our theme song is her composition fittingly titled By the Grave. Additional music provided by Pond5 and Premium Beat. Post-production and editorial services provided by Authentic. And additional editing by Jason Kang. To see photos from the case and read more information about Murder Book, go to murderbookpodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Chapter 4 is up next. <laughs>